हम होमियो हो रेंगे क्यों हे हु इज दैट गाय आई लुक सो डिफरेंट विदाउट दी हेयर ऑन माई फेस but it's uh we're getting into the 90s here in mississippi and more importantly high humidity so um uh, it's just unbearable anything that increases uh humidity and heat on the body we're such a privileged species aren't we <laughs> all right so here i am naked in front of you and we're going to complete i don't know i'm in a weird mood today um we're going to complete the hero of the world um go show um i mean i don't know what it is about that title that rubs me the wrong way it has those words that hero specifically has such a tremendous amount of cultural baggage with it doesn't it um but i think in this sense we can accept or or think of a uh, hero as uh the kind of example mentorship leadership if you will that is um uh, focused on the maximal potential and expression of everyone around them rather than a selfish kind of imposing of a hero stature of uh being uh how shall i say some kind of uh well uh a fetishizing a deification uh, in this sense this is not uh, what the description of uh, shakyamuni is uh, or anyone emulating shakyamuni which is the point um as a, that kind of a hero more a hero as a powerful instantiation of leadership maximal potential and attainability for all of those who witness him so uh it's much more about leadership and fulfillment than it is about uh power and uh omniscience right all right so now uh nature has made the point that to uh practice buddhism is not about governance governance being an outside in kind of force whereas buddhism is an inside out kind of force on a 30,000 foot level they may appear similar and uh this is where i'm noticing some of the translation problems in this uh because we start out and it's going to happen again so i'm going to point it out uh nitrin very specifically points a different of buddhism concerning itself with victory or defeat and there's the hero analogy uh while secular authority is based on the principle of reward and punishment and then he goes on in the, in in the translation here to show that uh there are consequences to improper practice of buddhism which get conflated with punishment which is incorrect because that's a secular authority um whereas strictly in buddhism that is defeat because what is victory or defeat what are the, what is the element of victory or defeat in buddhism it is awakening it is are you working toward resolving developing confidence and actuating your victory over um uh, attachment and uh um you know your sufferings Uh, or are you allowing your desires your monkey mind and your um earthly mundane issues to drag you away from your enlightened nature your buddha nature that would be defeat see everything in buddhism is a measure of your mental life condition so you're either working toward enlightenment or you're working against it there's just no in between 
um, there are there's a gray area whereas someone who's ignorant of Buddhism or the Lotus Sutra uh, well Buddhism generally uh, is may generally be working against their own enlightenment but they're doing so in ignorance or foolishness or pick your adjective um, whereas somebody who does know Buddhism um, then the line falls on Lotus Sutra if you're blindly following earlier forms provisional forms of Buddhism then you are actively working against your own awakening and that's far more troublesome that's far more defeating because you should know better because Buddhism is about study building confidence and practicing the ultimate form and if you're resisting that you would have to be resisting that because your ignorance is no longer acceptable once you begin along the path of studying Buddhism to be ignorant is something willful whereas if you're non-Buddhist you don't know any better then your ignorance is your ignorance it's not that you know better it's that you simply don't know so there are different consequences to ourselves again Buddhism is internal individual right whereas with governance secular authority authoritarianism uh, the principle is of if you're good I'll give you something and if you're not good I will hurt you harm you in some way that's punishment right so to say that Buddhism has aspects of punishment that's very confusing language shouldn't be that way so that I fault the translators of these things um, they either do it again purposefully because they know better but they think that that will appease or appeal to a Western audience that has largely lived under the religious rule of good bad right and wrong again the terms evil and all of this that keep popping up here are westernizations um, and so as hard and as willful as I am to clarify that language I don't get it all but uh, I hope that by having these kinds of little moments of conversation I, I will alert you to this as I will in a moment because we're going to run headlong into it again so let's get back into the go show if there are any and now so now Nietzsche and what I was saying has indicated the difference uh, between uh, government and uh, uh, Buddhist uh, goals um, but then he's going to address this other group which he knows he's talking to that are Buddhist aware certainly in Japan everyone was aware of Buddhism because it was part and dovetailed into governance so there's a confusion built in in Japan right many cultures but we're talking about Japan right now and so he, he goes on to say if there are among my followers who are weak in a res in resolve and go against what I Nitrin say they will meet the same face fate as did the Soga family I will tell you the reason it was due to the efforts of father and son Soga no Ainami and Umako that Buddhism came to be established in Japan they could have held the same position as Brahma and Chakra at the time of the thus come one Shakyamuni's appearance in this world what they were doing was amazingly a wonderful uh, uh, mentorship if you will leadership heroing of Buddhism in Japan because they had brought Manobe no Okoshi and his son Moriya to ruin they became the only influential can, uh, clan in the country they rose in rank and controlled the nation and their family enjoyed high prosperity so here's part of that confusion is that prosperity is a mundane earthly thing so 
if your life condition is higher, then you will enjoy a better life. Be that prosperity, quote unquote, or simply just a better state of mind, a more actualized uh, fulfillment of your life. Um, that's really what Buddhism is about. It's not about prosperity. Again, you could take that apart. Prosperity in Buddhism is your life condition, not the the amount of money you have or the amount of land you own or the car you drive or the, so on and so forth. Those are earthly desires, right? And um, though you may accrue more of those to support your life condition, your life condition is truly supported by your Buddhist practice, not by the things you own, right? So, a little confusing. But Umako grew so arrogant, again, because of the mundane appearance of success, that he had Emperor Shushun assassinated and many princes killed. Certainly not Buddhist behavior. But he felt emboldened by his power, mundane power, not Buddhist enlightenment power. Shushun assassinated many princes killed. Moreover, his grandson, Iruku, now he's showing that this is a generational thing, right? This is a, a, a karmic connection shared. Uh, his grandson had his retainers put 23 of Prince Shotoku's children to death getting more and more severe now, isn't it? Because this wasn't about killing the children. This was about making a statement to force the parents. This is getting, this is the world of anger, by the way, if you're wondering. This is the backstabbing, manipulative kind of anger. Thereupon, Empress Kogyoku, following the advice of Nakatomi no Kamako, had a statue cast of Shakyamuni Buddha and meditation to it uh, meditated to it fervently. As a result, Iruka, his father, and the entire Soga family all perished at once. He doesn't say how or why, whether it was part of the plague or not. He's just saying they all perished, the entire family line. Draw your own conclusions from what I've said above. Those among my followers who failed to carry through their resolute mind to the end will incur, and here it says punishment, which I take issue with, they will incur, what? Defeat. In other words, they will distance themselves from the goal of attainment of Buddhahood. But here they will incur punishment even more severe. So, what what may be unsaid here is that if you if you work against your own enlightenment with your buddhist practice and you were and you you act in your daily life as human as arrogant and killing and slaughtering people definitely not buddhist then you're working against your own enlightenment in the secular realm you will incur punishment, in other words, social actions that will diminish your life condition. But this punishment is not from bad Buddhist. This punishment is from bad mundane life actions, secular action. But I, I have to point this out because this could easily be read as a typical religious retribution right but that's you sh it's an error to connect that literally it's a result of but it it's only a connection um ancillary to your practice it's about your life condition and how you manifest it in this life in this life is the mundane um what's the word i'm looking for the samsaric uh reality so the two are um, the two are, I will say it this way, the, the two are connected the way your image in a mirror is connected to you. The image in a mirror is a false illusion, a thing that doesn't, it's ephemeral, right? But the 
the you that's being reflected, that you is what we experience in this place and time. So the illusion, the mirror being samsara, the, the self, I know this sounds contradictory, but go with me here, is your Buddhist practice, your uh, work toward enlightenment, your own enlightenment, which by the study of Buddhism we understand is also our environment, our, our radiated influence into our self, our true self, our Buddha self, and therefore our environment even though we practice as a human self, right? And then there is our interactions physically in the, in the, uh, the uh, samsaric realm, the earthly realm, the physical realm, right? Even so, they should not harbor a grudge against me just because, they're su just because we suffer. Even though we're practicing Buddhists, if, for this example, we don't, we turn against or turn away from the Lotus Sutra and we say, well, I'm going to practice this kind of Buddhism because it's more entertaining or it's easier for me or, and I'll throw my energy into that. You're actively working against uh, Nichiren's doctrine of the Lotus Sutra or just the Lotus Sutra. He says, don't fault me if you're experiencing difficulties in life. You're going to anyway because that's samsara. That's what you're battling in, spiritually in your mind, but uh, because you have difficulties, don't blame don't blame me. Don't say, "Well, Nietzsche doesn't know what he's talking about." F look at your own practice, see where it is lacking, or where you're consciously working against it. Question yourself, not me, right? Remember what fate Shobo, Notobo, and others met. So. He's referring to these stories he's been talking about, and he's cautioning his own members. Now, why is he doing this in a letter to Shijo Kingo? We'll find out more about that in a moment. As we've discussed several times now through several go shows, Shijo Kingo's position and life, life, actual life, is, uh, is quite precarious during these years. Um, he's a samurai. He works for Lord Emma. Um, He's not going with the flow of the general leadership practicing Nembutsu. Uh, so he's kind of a thorn in the side, spiritually anyway, um, to his fellow samurai, number one, and certainly to his uh, lord, his, his employer, Lord Emma. Uh, so, you know, there's all these machinations amongst the other samurai to embarrass him or to, to even... Um, uh, falsely report things to the boss, Lord Emma, uh, to ingratiate themselves, to diminish Shijo Kingo's influence, uh, to run him out of town so they can take over his position in Lord Emma's uh, favor. But he's, Shijo Kingo is hard to get rid of. He's uh, the only one amongst them who has medical knowledge, so more than once he's really rehabilitated uh, Lord Emma's health. So there's quite a debt Lord Emma feels and quite no, no doubt fear that if he gets rid of Shinjo Kingo entirely, he's going to lose his, uh, his important medical uh, doctor, if you will, um, and his protections, his health's protections. Um, but of course, what's harder to see is Shijo Kingo's life condition as a Lotus Sutra practitioner and a follower of Nichiren. Um, it, it protects him, an aura that either those around him fail to understand, certainly feel, or rebel against. That is what their problem is. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of mistrust and there's a lot of uh, potential for um, Shinjo Kingo's life to come to an end because samurai, it's their job to kill, to assassinate. So he, he's got to have one eye behind his shoulder, right? So this is where Nichiren appeals to him, even though there may be doubts and the people around him have doubts how to practice and how they're not practicing correctly and 
Nichiren's over and over again, not just to Shiju Kingo, but to everyone in Japan, demonstrated through actual examples of the day how things are happening in the country as a result of the history, hundreds of years of history, of working against the Lotus Sutra. These are Buddhists now, not non-Buddhists. So Buddhism is very much an influence of the life condition of the country through all of the individuals who practice it, right? And if they're all Nembutsu, then there's a tremendous uh, force of um, defeat, right? Remember uh, uh, victory or defeat? There's a tremendous force of defeat inculcated into the culture and the country of Japan. And so they get invaded, they have civil wars. Nichiren is drawing a, a, an actual analogy here that's witnessable, as, I, as we call it, actual proof of the Lotus Sutra as superior. So, um, after saying all of that and illustrating the position, uh, the, the condition of the country, uh, Nichiren now is speaking directly to Shijo Kingo and saying, be extremely cautious. And for the time being, never submit yourself to writing a pledge, as we heard Lord Emma wanted an oath from him. Don't even bother doing that, whatever it may concern. Don't be writing any pledges. Don't be documenting your rebellious beliefs. They're only rebellious because of the people around you. What you're trying to do is something correct, but to push it is inappropriate for you to do. It will it may easily cost you your life. So this is an instance where you might say, Shakabuku is not advisable to you right now. You need to be more the example, showed you. Live your life correctly, but this is a cautious time. Don't be too forward in your displeasure with those who stab you in the back or your, the whims of your Lord, which seem to be easily influenced. Don't react too violently. Be cautious. No matter how furiously a fire may rage, it burns out after a while. On the other hand, water may appear to move slowly, but it flows does, uh, its flow does not easily vanish. So be more like water rather than raging like a fire. Even though those around you might rage like fire, they will burn out. Since you are hot tempered, now he takes Shijo Kingo to task directly here. Since you are hot tempered and behave like a blazing fire, you will certainly be deceived by others. They'll take advantage of that. If your Lord coaxes you with soft words, I'm sure you will be won over just as a fire is extinguished by water. Untempered iron quickly melts in a blazing fire, like ice put in hot water. Now he's appealing to Shijo Kingo the samurai because they were very much aware of uh, iron and metallurgy given their katanas, their swords, uh, an artwork of metallurgy and processing, right? But a sword, he says, even when exposed to a great fire, withstands the heat for a while because it has been well forged. In admonishing you in this way, I am trying to forge your resolute mind. In other words, don't take offense to me pointing out that you're hot-tempered. What I'm trying to do is get you to evolve in your, in your thinking, in your practice, in your livelihood, and understand yourself a little more deeply, right? So, I want to encourage you to practice that much more fervently. Buddhism is reason, Nichiren says. Reason will win over your Lord. No matter how dearly you may love your wife and wish to never part from her, when you die, it will be to no avail. Now he's uh, talking about the impermanence that Buddhism always talks about, right? Your attachment, your earthly des desires, your things may be very important to you, even your sword. But they're temporary things. What is permanent is your life condition. What is permanent is the way 
that you live your life to its fullest. That is what, after everything else, remains. No matter how dearly you may cherish your estate, when you die it will only fall into the hands of others. So, you know, if, if even your boss threatens to take away your lands, don't overreact. Don't, don't go to war over it. I mean, you don't need to feel good about it, but you need your priority should be your enlightenment. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, right? It will only fall in the hands of others. You have been prosperous enough for all these years, right? Remember what you have and what you've accomplished, right? You must not give your estate a second thought because he knows full well that this is, and we've talked about this before, that one of the ways his boss has threatened him is by taking away his lands, his prosperity. As I've said before, by, be, be millions of times more careful than ever, right? Be very wild, watchful and mindful of what is happening around you and don't simply react to it. Easier said than done, as we, we all know, but there's the reminder. Since childhood, I, Nichiren, have never meditated for the secular things of this life, but have single-mindedly sought to become a Buddha. There it is. This is, this is our whole task in practicing uh, Nichiren's school of Lotus Sutra. Single-mindedly sought to become a Buddha, or to meld with our Buddha nature, or to awaken our Buddha nature. Say it any way you will. But this is quite direct. Nietzsche says this, this is the whole goal of my practice, to realize my Buddha, I, my Buddha nature, my Buddha mind, adjectives insert here. Of late, however, I have been ceaselessly meditating for your sake to the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni Buddha, and the deity of the sun, for I'm, I am convinced that you are a person who can inherit there's another bad word tra translation. You inherit the heart and mind of the Lotus Sutra. Here it says soul. So I have to fix that. Shouldn't be in here. Inherit the heart and mind of the Lotus Sutra. Be extremely careful not to come into conflict with others. Do not meet anyone at any place other than your own house. None of the night watchmen are sufficiently dependable, but considering that they have, uh, they had their residences confiscated because of their resolute mind in the Lotus Sutra, you should, under ordinary uh, circumstances, maintain friendly relations with them. Then they will exercise extra caution on their nightly rounds and provide you with protection, even should the people on your own side make a slight error pretend not to see or hear it because we're in a very volatile situation right now and even those who do as you do follow the lotus sutra are you know they're human and they may succumb to threats uh and and you know manipulations from uh, those who feel emboldened because they follow uh, the the national uh, path of uh, nembutsu so be cautious. Don't don't write them off outright, but at the same time have some compassion for what they're going through just as what you're going through. Even if your Lord should ask to hear the teachings of Buddhism, do not heedlessly rejoice and rush off to see him. Right? He might say, okay, let's hear your point of view. Let's hear uh, what Nichiren is teaching you. Tell me about the Lotus Sutra. Um, that's a great opportunity, but be very careful because even if his, even if Lord Emma's wishes were genuine, um, he's going to be challenging his own inculcated beliefs from, uh, the long history of Nembutsu in his life. So you go trotting in there and going, here I am to save the day, like Mighty Mouse, um, Lord Emma could easily sway his own opinion and turn on you. So be careful how you approach such an opportunity, even 
if it even happens, right? Answer mildly that you are not sure that you can comply. I mean, kind of resist. Man, I'm not sure I'm the right teacher for you, right? And that you will consult with some of my disciples. If you betray great joy in your countenance and allow yourself to be drawn in by his desire to hear the teachings, you will bring everything to ruin as surely as fire consumes whatever it will burn or as rain falls from heaven. If the opportunity arises, submit to your Lord the petition I have written on your behalf since it contains matters of great import, it will certainly create a stir. So that's his guidance there. It's like, if you have somebody who comes in your life who's been uh, kind of opposing what you do as a, as a practitioner of the Lotus Sutra, and then one day, whether it's genuine or not, and we, let's assume genuine, then okay, let me know why you believe what you believe. I'm interested to hear uh, what you're doing and why. Um, what Nietzsche is saying is, don't be overly confident and don't rejoice. Don't see this as an opportunity for you, but see it as an opportunity for this friend, or in this case, Lord Emma, um, to begin to practice correctly. Uh, guide them to, some, to me, to Nitrin. Given that letter I wrote for you, not only because it's pertinent to the situation, but because that petition, uh, that letter that I wrote to you about the petition, talks directly to this dissonance between the Mutsu and Lotus Sutra. There's a teaching in that. And that's a teaching that will be very contemporaneous and have a samsaric relation that Lord Emma could learn from. Plus, if it stirs him up, as he predicts, his anger will be directed toward Nichiren, not toward Shijo Kingo. So he can, Shijo Kingo has an opportunity to endure, uh, um, introduce Lord Emma to Nichiren, right, to the teachings themselves, rather than standing as an intermediary, which then makes him vulnerable, Shijo Kingo, to retribution from whatever Lord Emma might have difficulties with here. Don't put yourself in that path. So that's an interesting teaching. Sometimes, even though we're so excited about our practice that if we have somebody who asks us about it, uh, on the one hand, we may feel like we're not capable of teaching. That's overwhelmingly what happens. We, we cower and go, I don't know. Or we rush to it and we say a bunch of stuff and then they question us back and we don't have the scholarship to be able to answer them with authority. So we start to kind of fall apart. So we're worried about that happening too. So, whenever possible, rely on the teachings, not on your ability to teach them, right? That's why the overwhelming advice when somebody, whether they're, confrontation aside, uh, they may come to you really curious, wanting to learn. Um, take that opportunity to lead them to mandala and chant with you. Because in that way, you're bringing Nietzsche into the conversation. You're bringing the Lotus Sutra into the conversation. And you're allowing their own actual practice to awaken them to why you do what you do. Be careful about volunteering information that's important to you that may not relate to them. Let them find what relates to them. Remember, in numerous paths. We all have our own triggers and experience and ways of learning. So put as much of uh, the practice of Buddhism on the person who wants to practice it because that is ultimately where their answers will come from and their support and their resolve, right? So I hope that makes sense to you. We have one more very brief Go Show to read in this fourth volume of collections and then we start on the next one um once again can't thank you enough for being here don't forget to download the uh, buddhahood podcast 
uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Are, they're simply uh, audio versions of these videos. Um, and that way you can listen to them whenever you like. Um, I, 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 promotion of channel. It's just such a YouTube thing. I just want you to strengthen your practice. And I want to give you my uh, my wholehearted appreciation for your practice and uh, your your patience with me <laughs> and uh, any support that you can give this uh, channel this this effort of the Sangha um, is very very deeply appreciated. Thank you so much. We'll see you in the next one. Bye. Namo Myoho Renge Kyo.